Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, we're uh, very pleased to have today Dr. Derek uh, Chu talking to us. Uh, Dr. Chu obtained his uh, combined MD PhD uh, degree in 2014, followed by internal medicine uh, training and training in pediatric and allergy, adult allergy and immunology, uh, completed in 2019. During his uh, clinical training, he won numerous uh, number of awards in clinical and research. He's currently an assistant professor uh, in the research educator track in the Department of Medicine and uh, Department of uh, Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact. Dr. Chu holds multiple hats, you know, wears multiple hats. He's the director of Canada First World uh, Allergy Center of Excellence. He's the Allergy Training Program Residency Research Director. And uh, he's the allergy division EDI champion, among other positions also he uh, holds and contributes to. He's highly published, numbers are numerous, uh, in major uh, general journals, you know, in Lancet, uh, JAMA, and BMJ. Uh, his focus on his, his research is focused on optimal prevention of and treatment of food allergy and anaphylaxis, and the evidence synthesis and guidelines development and allergy immunology. And his work has influenced clinical practice and research uh, globally. I'm uh, very proud to have uh, Derek as part of our team. He will talk to us uh, today about his uh, uh, perspective on the past, present, and future of uh, food uh, allergy. Uh, Derek, please uh, go ahead. Thanks so much, Cal, for the kind introduction. I'll just turn on the share screen now, uh, and then we can go from there. All right, thanks so, so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, I'll give you some perspectives about um, uh, of where food allergy has been uh, classically been, as, as well as some challenges that we face today, and ideally, um, how we might address them in the future. So when we talk about food allergy, uh, this is about primarily um, many different possible responses to foods. Uh, but the focus of today is actually on this left side of the chart, the immune mediated uh, uh, actual allergic responses, and those specifically in the bottom left called IgE mediated responses. Those are those that uh, result very rapidly in hives developing, um, in nausea vomiting, as well as what we most commonly might think of of anaphylaxis. Uh, the burden of food allergy is high in, in Canada and the rest of the world, with overall estimates being in the range of six and nine percent of the population for any food allergy, uh, slightly higher among children compared to adults. However, uh, the, the burden is still high among both. And then you can see on the left hand side that peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, as well as things like milk and egg are the most common uh, and range between one and 2% uh, on average. There is a slight difference between those that uh, perceive to be allergic to foods, that's on the right-hand side, versus those that have a clinician confirmed diagnosis, which is on the left. Uh, and I'll touch more upon that uh, later on in the slide deck uh, as well. Recent estimates about the economic burden of food allergy place it at $41 billion Canadian per year, uh, with primary, uh, primarily the cost being indirect. Um, and so the burden is substantial. When it comes to food allergy, it probably the easiest way to think about it, uh, and where we've come from um, is about the uh contrast between this concept of vaccination or prophylaxis uh versus allergy and anaphylaxis so whereas in vaccination being exposed to a substance once then protects you against it in the future in anaphylaxis it a initial exposure then predisposes you to harm from the substance in the future and the classic paradigm or the classic allergen that we've thought of for anaphylaxis has been peanut. So in peanut allergy, on average, about one to two percent have the condition. The manifestations can range from a mild local uh, urticarial eruption, such as uh, what's being seen here on the face of this infant in the middle uh, of the screen, versus a systemic whole body reaction 
uh, which we were referred to as anaphylaxis, what's depicted on the right side of this child that's intubated. The classic treatment has been lifelong strict avoidance and that we worry because uh, estimates put accidental exposure at being about 55% over five years. Quite high if we think about, in comparison, for example, cardiovascular risk and us typically quoting numbers in the range of 10 years and 10% plus. Um, from a pathophysiologic basis, uh, we believe this disease is primarily driven by IgE. Uh, in a, and if you think back to Jelen Coombs in terms of pathophysiology, type 1 hypersensitivity, and that fundamentally how this process all started was due to a disruption or loss of immunologic tolerance, leading to what we uh, refer to in immunology as type 2 immunity uh, and allergy. Now, classically, we think about anaphylaxis as exceptionally serious and to be very fearful of it. Uh, the classic definition as showed here in the title is a serious allergic reaction that is rapid in onset and may cause death. And for years, we have we have uh, proposed to be uh, thinking about this as the killer allergy, highly dangerous. So for example, who is at risk? Anyone, especially those allergic to foods, peanut, tree nut, seafood, fish, milk, egg, insect bites, natural rubber, latex, and medications. It can happen at any moment, within minutes, within contact. How do we know severe symptoms can happen uh, itching, hives, flushing, difficulty breathing, dizziness, confusion, any kind of manifestation in any organ system. Where can, where can it happen? Anywhere. Whether that be at home, at a restaurant, at school, or a child care, a bus, or, or an airplane. What should you do? Immediately inject epinephrine at any sign. You should call 911, seek emergency care immediately, and act quickly. And why is follow-up needed? You need to uh, worry about anaphylaxis happening multiple times and repeatedly, and that it needs to be confirmed and long-term strategies need to be implemented. In some cases, this is true, and likely a lot of this came from a good place. However, I hope to show you that uh, there may be some new points and nuances that we're discovering in the next uh, few slides. So this all starts with understanding who is actually at risk of such um, fear-based teaching. And that centers around the concept of diagnosing food allergy. So when we think about food allergy, the diagram on the left shows how upon the first exposure, there's immune processes that take place, antigen presentation to T cells, and that leads to B cells being activated to produce IgE. And the IgE is ultimately loaded onto uh, mast cells loaded that are within our tissues uh, and when we diagnose food allergy, our thought has been if we can detect the presence of IgE uh, using various tests, then that will tell us, yes, that patient is allergic. And so the classic way we've done this is we've taken patients. Um, an example here is the back of an infant um, and said, Okay, we do. We are uncertain, or maybe this patient is at risk for developing a food allergy. Let's test them to uh, multiple foods and see if any one of them develops a wheel um, or a local urticarial eruption at the site of a skin prick test. And if that is the case, then they must be allergic. And so you can see. Uh, for many years, what would happen is that infants would come in and they would be tested to a panel of allergens. For example, here, peanut, walnut, almond, cashew, pecan, hazelnut, pistachio, and then our controls such as histamine and saline, uh, egg, dairy, salmon, shrimp, halibut, uh, and a number of them would come up as positive. And so we would tell this person, you are allergic to many different foods, in this case, pistachio, egg, dairy, salmon, cashew. You should avoid all these because of that fear-based teaching. You should avoid them strictly because if you come into any minute contact, you could die. Uh, and this has been, uh, uh, you know, the typical teaching for many years uh, based off of testing. Well, the problem is uh, 
you know, with allergy now hopefully uh, catching up with the principles of evidence-based medicine, uh, we did a systematic review linked to a guideline. Um, you can see here the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters is the definitive authority for developing guidelines uh, across North America and is highly influential worldwide. Um, and when we actually looked at all the evidence for the utility of skin prick testing and other tests for diagnosing peanut allergy, we actually came to somewhat of an existential crisis. You can see here the various nomograms that many of you may be familiar with. On the left-hand side, uh, it depicts what the diagnostic test accuracy is for skin prick testing. You can see here individuals that are, say, at a 50% probability when they appear to, when they present to you uh, uh, before doing an actual skin prick testing. Uh, if you were to do a skin prick test and it's positive, the likelihood ratio estimated is approximately two for a positive skin prick test. And that would only change your probability of understanding if they're actually allergic from being 50% pre-test to about 65% post-test. Likewise, if that test was negative, it would bring you from 50% down to about 5%. Um, and there are other tests here, such as a blood test called specific IgE or a uh, more specific type of blood test to one allergen within all of peanut called ARH2 that all reflect a similar scenario. That, that is to say that skin testing and other allergy tests may mislead. They may not actually diagnose anyone perfectly and they may not perfectly rule out the condition. And so what else could we be wrong about? Well, this pattern of testing being imperfect um, and far from uh, potentially definitively informative is actually borne out in other tests. So this is one recent uh, uh, example in cashew allergy as well, where if you take a cutoff for, again, skin prick testing, whether at three millimeters or eight millimeters, and you look at someone's pretest probability, Across a range of pretest probabilities, the post test is not necessarily definitive. Even, for example, when you have someone at a very high pretest probability with a high cutoff, in this case, eight millimeters, and it's still positive, that may boost your post test probability to 95%. Classically, we may say to individuals, a 95% probability is sufficient to say to individuals, you're allergic, uh, and let's call it a day. However, at the same time, we face a situation where perhaps that should be a little bit more nuanced conversation. Often when we ask patients, you know, you have a large skin test, maybe you don't have a history of any clinical reaction to that food, uh, and if this, we believe, is a 95% uh, post-test probability with likely wide confidence intervals, um, is that a high enough level for you to be content with a lifelong diagnosis? Often these food allergies, like I said, last a lifetime. And if we are wrong at this moment, would you prefer to actually try to introduce the food? Uh, or if we're right, should we, uh, would we, we would run into a situation where uh, the reference standard being a food challenge may provoke a mild reaction. And so in actuality, what we need to do is not only find better studies, but also bring more into the conversation a concept of shared decision making when making diagnoses. The other existential crisis that we faced was that uh, was a problem of the quality of the evidence that we have to date. You can see here in our systematic review of the peanut allergy data on the left-hand side, all the available uh, studies were at risk of bias, particularly for patient selection, as well as other issues with the reference standard and flow and timing. That means not all studies use the reference standard of oral food challenge to confirm the diagnosis of allergy. And secondly, for flow and timing, individuals were not necessarily blinded to the result of one test. So for example, doing the reference standard, the food challenge may have been influenced by knowledge of the skin prick test in advance or vice versa. 
So uh, at the end of the day, we have many studies. They are not ultimately a high quality body of evidence. Uh, and so one message that came out of this is that we need better studies and we need to, for the allergy community to wake up to uh, being able to have the method support and clinical prioritization of doing research as part of uh, improving the evidence for the future. So we may come to the existential crisis and actually face the situation where we will throw out skin testing, which we've had for centuries. But uh, we need the data to actually understand what is the position of skin testing and who benefits from skin testing and which situations should we avoid it. So part of the reason why getting the diagnosis right is so important is because we've understood now through a number of randomized trials that unnecessarily avoiding foods can promote the actual development of food allergy. Somewhat circular logic in that if one uh, comes to a clinician, avoids a food for a long period of time uh, because they believe the skin test is positive, uh, but they, if they were actually give that, given that food at that moment, they could eat it no problem. If they instead avoid it, uh, then they may actually develop food allergy in a somewhat self-fulfilling prophecy. So in this body of evidence, what occurred was there was a number of randomized trials that either randomized individuals to introducing foods at around four to six months of age or purposely told infants to avoid introducing foods for at least a year, if not longer. And you can see in the forest plot across egg allergy, peanut allergy, and milk allergy that all the estimates suggest that purposely avoiding introducing the foods for a prolonged period of time beyond a year of age of introduction can actually increase the risk of developing a food allergy. Or conversely, if one introduces early compared to late, that you may be able to prevent food allergy. Again, a potential lifelong diagnosis. And these data, although they're focusing on the diagnosis of food allergy, also tracked with the incidence of other outcomes such as anaphylaxis and allergic reactions. So to improve the diagnosis and prevention of food allergy, the, we are now understanding that skin tests alone can mislead. It may suggest that uh, patients at risk instead will have positive skin tests but that it is a window of opportunity to intervene, again, in possibly changing the trajectory of a potentially lifelong disease. We do need better studies that include all patients suspected of being allergic to foods. Um, the clarification of diagnosis needs to be timely as well, because again, we have thought about avoiding uh, those, those randomized trials I just showed you, where the comparison between an early introduction in the first few months of life versus those after about a year. And we suspect, because of some observational data, that the longer you wait beyond a year, the higher the chance of actually developing a food allergy. Now, oral food challenge is a reference standard, but food challenges are time consuming and are limited in access and availability and expertise in the community setting, uh, in part because of this fear-based teaching in the past, Clinicians may be worried about disrupting their clinic, uh, a very busy community practice clinic, because of uh, the potential for someone to react. And so that is specifically why at McMaster, we developed uh, and uh, created this dedicated diagnostic research allergy clinic, which I head up and will actually be returning to right after today's grand rounds. So uh, with that in mind, um, I pose to you now, you know, true or false, does having a peanut allergy mean eating any amount will cause a serious allergic reaction to occur? And if you're, if you're getting a sense, that's actually some of the information, some of the answers are coming from what we're doing in this dedicated research clinic. So in this clinic, instead of doing oral food challenges with, with somewhat arbitrary amounts, we have created standard operating procedures and uh, protocolized food challenges where we introduce increasing amounts in a quantitative fashion. We measure out each dose 
seven different doses in this example for peanut, and we can do essentially allergies version of a cardiac stress test. By doing this, we can quantify the how uh, sensitive individuals that are allergic are, and also in a very controlled fashion, diagnose or not or rule in or rule out someone actually being allergic to the food that they're suspected to. So what what are the results so far? So in our early pilot data, we found that on average, these food challenges are time intensive. They take about two to three hours to do. Of about 700 food challenges to, to date among all the faculty uh, here um, in the allergy division, we found that about six out of seven did not have any reaction. These are individuals that were suspected of being allergic in the first place, uh, but they actually were not. And of the remainder, one out of seven did have a reaction upon challenge. However, by going very slowly and carefully, most of these were mild and affected by only one body part, typically the skin. The reaction typically went away quite quickly with a single dose of antihistamines. And then we had both a diagnosis, a quantitative value for how sensitive they were, as well as clarity beyond that skin test. 4% uh, or four individuals out of 100, uh, in total four out of 700, required a single dose of epinephrine before they quite calmly and easily went home directly from clinic. And so even if this is early and what we now call mild anaphylaxis, technically meeting the definition of two organ systems, maybe mild wheeze, uh, only an auscultation, and also some hives, we could do that and they easily be reversed before they could go home. And this has led to the creation with, with, we're very thankful for the support from both Hamilton Health Sciences New Investigator Fund, as well as Health Canada to develop the Titan Registry. Here, the concept is every clinic patient that comes to my dedicated Thursday uh, allergy clinic is invited to enroll into the Titan Registry so that there's systematic evaluation of all individuals suspected to be food allergic. It's a specialty clinic service so that um, everything is protocolized. Other allergists can refer in uh, to have patients go through this process as well as joint research. It clarifies the concept of diagnostic accuracy by having all suspected allergic individuals and that all will receive the index tests of skin prick testing, blood testing, and some specialized tests I'll show you soon, as well as the food challenge. And that uh, it works towards the concept of a learning health system whereby research is part of routine clinical care. So one of the tests that we are developing is a specialty test called basal activation testing. This is kind of a way of doing a food challenge in a dish and may uh, come to the point where it can obviate some need for food challenges. You can see here in, in some preliminary data, if we take basophils from the blood out of individuals and incubate them with the allergen that they might be allergic to, it can distinguish those that are allergic from not allergic, that blue line versus the red line. On the x-axis are different concentrations in vitro uh, that uh, help provide us a dose response curve and may also correlate with say sensitivity or severity of reactions. On the right-hand side are some sample receiver operating curves of our preliminary data, um, and we are going to develop this further as we uh, continue to build Titan so that we can develop ROC curves and provide quantitative measures of how um, uh, these diagnos diagnostic tests perform for the future. This may also serve uh, to develop a reference standard again for, say, McMaster to become a, uh, a site where patients are able to send, or clinicians and patients are able to send in their blood work in order to get their blood tested to potentially obviate food challenges if the diagnostic test accuracy is sufficient. Um, in addition, we are trying to uh, uh, right now use Titan as a, uh, the, the initial stages of a clinical research network. The current setup is that individuals and clinicians refer their patients in to McMaster as a central site. 
but we are in the early stages of moving Titan from this kind of model to developing capacity and understanding uh, to a different kind of model whereby we can begin to create the infrastructure for large clinical trials. We can then, uh, by developing expertise and infrastructure at each individual site across the GTA, Canada, and other locations, other countries, we can then have McMaster become a methods coordinating center and develop the same kind of clinical research infrastructure that has been so successful for, say, cardiovascular trials or critical care trials, and et cetera. And so Titan is in the early stages of developing this, and uh, that will include um, things such as harmonizing methods across sites, understanding local practices to begin with, and the patient populations. This is so critical because, um, as I've shown you before, you know, the typical criticism is that individuals presenting to an academic site, a university, are highly biased, are a very specific patient population, whereas those that present to community sites are really where the majority of allergy care is uh, occurring uh, because allergy ultimately is primarily an outpatient practice. So I'm very excited about Titan and its prospects. Uh, um, now, shifting gears, one, one message that we've received from Titan is that, um, you know, in those that actually do have a reaction at Food Challenge, not everyone is the same. They don't all have the same kind of reaction. On one hand, uh, very few react to a, a minuscule amount, less than one milligram of peanut, for example. And on another hand, uh, about 50% will react to 70 milligrams on average. Um, so then why is there a difference in sensitivity? Why is there this gradient of sensitivity if, again, that classic teaching was any amount whatsoever will lead to a serious and life-threatening reaction immediately? So beyond that, how can we actually manipulate this sensitivity to, for therapeutic benefit? So this brings us to the concept of, of management. Um, if we can change sensitivity, then ultimately, from a clinical perspective, what outcome should we improve? Should we improve, say, for example, mortality? Although this is an exceptionally rare outcome, um, they're rare events, they're tragic when they do occur, and they're so prominent that single events often lead to changes in law and policy. So, for example, Sabrina's law in Ontario, uh, because of, of her unfortunate um, death, then what happened was they enacted a law to make sure that every school had a policy for anyone that's allergic to foods. Natasha's law in the UK um, also enacted a policy whereby now, now all foods must be labeled correctly to disclose allergens. Or should we, uh, in our clinical studies, our clinical trials, look at, say, anaphylactic events or allergic events that happen due to accidental exposure to allergens? at about 7% per year, 55% per year for over five years. So far, this actually has not been a focus of current clinical trials. Uh, or should we look at quality of life? You know, um, a little bit easier for maybe other conditions, but for food allergy, you can only have the manifestation uh, clinically if you eat the food. Um, so how do you measure disease activity? There's no dyspnea that comes with, for example, asthma, or the same kind of dyspnea that comes with, say, heart failure. Uh, we don't have the NYHA or ACQ to actually measure this. There's no daily expression of those symptoms. But quality of life, fear, um, loss of control, anxiety are all key components that play in and, and factor into the daily burden of having the condition. Uh, uh, likewise, for example, uh, when we think about clinical trials, how do we define success? And this is a, an open question that uh, there are not clear answers to right now, but um, we, when we think about patient important outcomes, uh, you know, I, when I've asked patients, they range in their answers in terms of being able to eat all the peanut ever, being able to only eat peanut when your doctor feeds it to you, uh, to change their amount of worry and stress, or to decrease the chance of having an allergic reaction or something else. 
And likewise, we also face uh, right now in terms of defining uh, key outcomes for clinical trials, what are the harms that individuals might uh, accept? And so we, need, we, we do need intense research over uh, the values and preferences of patients with food allergy to inform uh, next steps and their, the, what they value in terms of quality of life for improvements. Uh, one of the biggest questions uh, today is about something called oral immunotherapy. Uh, like I said before, this concept before uh, classically in food allergy has been to avoid, avoid, avoid foods. And on the right hand side, now in those with established food allergy, is this concept of introducing the food and trying to eat it as much as possible. And this is in part driven by, uh, by industry, by Nestle. Uh, at the end of the day, us allergists, uh, classically have thought about, you know, four different interventions. Avoid the exposure, corticosteroids, antihistamines, or desensitization. And this is all has to do with the concept of desensitization or immunotherapy. Oral immunotherapy for food allergy has taken the form uh, typically of a increasing amount of allergen that one is allergic to uh, over time, typically over the course of three to nine months. You can see here an initial dose escalation and then coming to clinic every week or two to increase the amount of food being eaten. And then when they reach a full peanut size between 300 milligrams to 4,000 milligrams, so that's between one peanut and essentially 13 peanuts, eaten per day, every day, uh, that is then kept as maintenance indefinitely um, so that the patient has been desensitized to peanut. The primary readout for how we've measured this is the oral food challenge. And so on the bottom here is the typical dose response curve that one can see from an oral food challenge. That uh, on the y-axis is the probability of having a reaction and the x-axis is the dose that the patient is given. And the concept has been, can we shift this curve or change the shape with immunotherapy uh, and potentially make that long lasting? So uh, when we systematically reviewed the evidence for this, we actually found some uh, striking results that um, uh, the first is that uh, this outcome that's being displayed on these forest plots is the outcome of anaphylaxis. And so with immunotherapy, we should be decreasing the amount of anaphylaxis that's occurring. However, what we instead found was that across all the clinical trials looking at oral immunotherapy for peanut, um, that it actually increased the risk of anaphylaxis by about threefold. And that's whether we think of anaphylaxis as a single event, one or more event, or multiple events over time, which is on the right-hand side, the incidence rate ratio. We found a similar finding for other uh, key patient important outcomes, such as the need for more epinephrine, serious adverse events, including hospitalization, permanent disability, or the need for immediate medical intervention to prevent any one of those, gastrointestinal events, respiratory events, mucocutaneous reactions, and that the certainty of the evidence for all these outcomes was moderate to high. Uh, we also found a number of uh, uh, factors here that were not important. So it did not seem the specific dose, at least between uh, greater than or less than 300 milligrams uh, among the studies that we, we looked at, was critical in changing uh, how often those larger reactions or anaphylactic events would occur on oral immunotherapy compared to not, or if that was uh, starting at a lower dose versus a higher dose, or if perhaps uh, that reaction occurred during that initial buildup phase versus the actual maintenance phase uh, during the immunotherapy. But what we did find was that the best patients on immunotherapy uh, appear to be in those studies that did not confirm if individuals were actually allergic. That is to say, perhaps, that individuals that are not allergic and on immunotherapy will not have anaphylaxis, likely because they're not allergic in the first place. We also found on the right-hand side that uh, uh, if individuals are given a higher amount of food at Food Challenge, they have a higher chance of reacting. That is to say that desensitization is incomplete. So on the y-axis is the risk of being able to pass a food challenge, and on the x-axis is the amount of food that is given 
add food challenge, and you see that it decreases over uh, uh, the dose given at food challenge. We also found that there is no improvement in quality of life um, uh, across these studies, although the evidence was lower in certainty, primarily because of risk of bias. So we look at food allergy nowadays uh, with this concept of oral immunotherapy that is being heavily promoted. And on the left side, we can see that uh, is what we've typically thought of avoidance. It is effective in preventing in-office reactions. It can also, it, it cannot prevent uh, in-clinic um, uh, reactions, but it can prevent out-of-clinic reactions. Reactions either way can be uh, dangerous and fatal, and that's been reported for both. In actuality, the first fatality from oral immunotherapy occurred in Ontario this year. Um, there can be adverse effects primarily from oral immunotherapy. In both cases, individuals still need to carry an epinephrine autoinjector. Ep the actual allergen that uh, one is allergic to cannot be eaten, and there are restrictions on daily activities with immunotherapy that come with it to try to prevent an accidental reaction to the actual immunotherapy from occurring, such as no sleep before dosing, no exercise. You can react during stress, menses, infections, pollen season, or NSAIDs. And that um, although living with food allergy is expensive, currently individuals are, are uh, billing outside of OHIP and charging patients directly tens of thousands of year, uh, dollars per year uh, in order to pursue it right now outside of um, standard care. And so, uh, one message that, that we've uh, taken from this PACE review of, of all food allergy oral immunotherapy, all peanut allergy immunotherapy, is that are we, uh, are we getting diminishing returns from taking the same approach of you know, feeding people large amounts of peanut every single day, one full peanut to 13 full peanuts? Maybe what we need is safer, less disruptive approaches, and we need to be able to sh show this in large, rigorous RCTs that we would demand in any other field of medicine and focus on patient important outcomes rather than purely just surrogates. Uh, and like I said before, we need to understand quality of life better and values and preferences. Uh, one way we've tried to address that is, uh, is in our recent clinical trial, um, looking at individuals with peanut allergy and putting them through a three-arm randomized uh, blinded trial called Pisces, where we gave them either peanut oral immunotherapy with or without antihistamines to try to reduce how often the side effects occurred. Uh, so among those that received antihistamines versus placebo, we did see a decrease in side effects of urticaria and abdominal pain. These are side effects of the immunotherapy itself. But instead, the trade-off was we saw an increase in just sedating our patients with more, uh, with the antihistamines themselves. And ultimately, we saw less quality of life among those given the antihistamines versus those that were on placebo antihistamine. Now in comparison, when we looked at those with oral immunotherapy alone versus placebo oral immunotherapy, yes, we did see that there was a high incidence of urticaria and abdominal pain. However, we found no difference in quality of life. And so there seems to be either that we've got the regimen wrong, there are still side effects that are not improving quality of life, despite the patient being desensitized, or perhaps we need a different approach. Um, and so when we think about allergists, it can be frustrating, um, and think about this history, it can be frustrating to think about why is progress so slow. On one hand, we should be having these magical um, improvements if immunotherapy is the perfect solution that we've been thinking about. Um, or perhaps we've, we've got it wrong, and, uh, and, and we may have to admit that in some ways we're uh, peddling snake oil. Um, do we need to be restricted to just these four interventions, avoiding corticosteroids, antihistamines, or desensitization? Or maybe we can have a more sophisticated approach. Um, part of the problem I submit to why we are having uh, an issue in a lack of progress is that we have uh, that allergy has been dominated by pursuing uh, fashion, hot topics, then those only being followed by small studies and financial gain. Primarily, we're being driven around by pharmaceutical industry when perhaps instead we need uh, a culture of randomized trials uh, 
a, uh, a the infrastructure and expertise to conduct large rigorous randomized trials that are investigator initiated and in partnership with with pharma if need be uh, and we need dedicated funding to actually support uh, this kind of culture of clinical investigation to be able to translate basic science findings as well as ensure that what we know um, uh, about existing therapies is actually true. Are these limitations needed? And I hope that through Titan and linked studies, we are trying to address that. Um, so we've had great experience in the past with being able to use allergen challenge methods such as Titan to address this uh, in the field of asthma. And perhaps we can use this for food allergy in the future. So for ASA, we know the role of immunotherapy of different molecules like eosinophils, IgE, IL-4, et cetera, in the pathogenesis of disease and, and the actual therapeutic potential. But for food allergy, we're in the dark. We need a dedicated infrastructure to systematically examine and move from proof of concept to definitive studies. And that, that means everything from provocation challenge to large clinical trials across nations. One example has been the great experience of folks like uh, Dr. Gavril, O'Byrne, Dolovich, and Hargreave in using allergen challenge to understand both the pathophysiology of asthma, but also the therapy potential of various interventions. So for example, on the left-hand side here, you can see they've used different interventions like budesonide, montelukast, or the combination to understand how it changes the allergen response to inhaled allergen challenge. In parallel, we're trying to examine the same thing with food allergy and the development of infrastructure like Titan to look at this dose response curve in food allergy challenges and begin to use that as a platform to interrogate maybe subthreshold doses of immunotherapy. If we can use doses below individuals' thresholds, is that sufficient to change their immune system? How about can we use this dose, this dose response to interrogate the role of mast cells or basophils or eosinophils? and link that to immune, immune assessments to understand the, the pathophysiology behind the clinical phenomena we're seeing. So in Titan, among those that are allergic, that we identify as actually being allergic, they are automatically offered enrollment into linked randomized trials. In one instance, we have uh, a trial that I'm very excited about and that we're launching now called TRADE that we're very fortunate to be, have been funded through HASO to look at smaller, lower doses of immunotherapy that are sub-threshold that might actually uh, be able to desensitize in a, a safer, less invasive way. So ultimately, uh, this concept of Titan and Trade uh, is trying to develop uh, research as part of routine clinical practice and integrate this all together. We need to move away from research being viewed as a separate culture from clinical care. They're one and the same. They can be one and the same. And that we need to address the inefficiencies of research infrastructure by merging it uh, and taking the opportunities provided in routine clinical care. And instead of being fragmented, there's a lot to learn from other specialties that we've already seen, such as critical care, and leverage those lessons that they've already learned, or cardiovascular care, or thrombosis, that we're also famous at McMaster uh, of uh, changing those fields. But we do need the will and the funding in order for this to be successful also in allergy. So one opportunity that, uh, that I submit to is this concept of a learning health system with the Odyssey transformation uh, in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and also innovation with best practices seamlessly embedded in the care process, patients and families active in all elements, and new knowledge captured as integral byproduct of the care experience. So in summary, um, fear-based thinking about food allergy has been problematic and we're learning that more and more now. Same thing with skin testing alone. Uh, oral food challenges are required and the Big Master Challenge Unit is one uh, uh, example of that, providing a critical service and developing a learning health system. Titan provides insights into diagnosis and prognosis and is linked and accelerates randomized trials. And TRADE starts an RCT program for newer and safer ways of training food allergy, but dedicated infrastructure uh, is needed for transformative change. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and I hope you uh, recognize this teal pumpkin, which is 
just coming up uh, in the next few days, uh, October 31st, of course, with Halloween. Uh, it's a sign of uh, being food allergy aware when you give out candy. Um, and again, of course, you know, none of this would be possible with so many people around me. So I'd like to thank everyone involved in, um, in our food allergy research program. Um, thanks so much. Derek, thank you so much for this uh, overview uh, and uh, challenging our thinking and thinking about <laughs> around uh, food uh, allergy. Uh, I'm sure many of us are impacted in so many ways, clinically and personally and professionally with this uh, con these concepts. So uh, I'm sure lots of people are thinking about lots of things right now. So uh, thank you and great work. Uh, I have Dr. Holbrook with her hand up. So again, you know, if anyone would like to bring up a question and part of the discussion, please raise your hand and I'll bring you in. Otherwise, type your uh, question in the Q&A section or uh, if you want to put a comment, you can put it in the, in the chat. Uh, and uh, please go ahead. All right. Thanks, Derek. That is really refreshing to see young people taking such a, a rigorous approach to a big, big area. I have three questions, but there, please just give a very brief answer. Two are big. This, uh, you know, food allergy was not a phenomenon when I went to school. You know, those of us are older, 50, 60 years ago, completely unheard of. Is there a very sort of quick summary of why this is so common? Number two is, does food allergy spill over to drug allergy? Is our notion that, in quotes, the allergic person is allergic to everything? And the third question is very specific. I was surprised that in your trial with H2 and uh, antihistamines that you, it looked like you still maybe got some drowsiness. You know, does that debunk our, our theory that the newer antihistamines are less sedating? Yeah, great, great points. Thanks so much. Okay, so I'll try to go one by one. First, do we know what is causing the rise in the food allergy epidemic or uh, quote unquote epidemic? We do have a review coming out and one of my PhD students has been heading that up. Uh, and the bottom line is you would be surprised by the lack of a definitive answer. Now, the one thought is yes, this, this concept of fear-based uh, teaching has actually been problematic. In the, in the past kind of 20, 30 years, initially we suggested avoid, avoid, avoid foods. Do not introduce them, do not introduce them. The immune system is not ready. And if you introduce them early, you will cause harm. You will actually promote food allergy from developing. And that was based off of the lack of rigorous guideline development. That's precisely why I'm part of these guideline development groups to uh, ensure that they are now embracing EBM properly and improve their processes in developing guidelines so that we can actually get it right. Um, the second point is that no one has actually systematically reviewed what are the risk factors for developing food allergy. So that's why we're doing it. Uh, so that's exactly what my PhD student is doing to try to understand what do we credibly know and not know about the productive and risk factors for food allergy. Secondly, um, uh, are uh, individuals allergic to everything? We suspect uh, drug allergy individuals are not necessarily the same as food, aller food allergy individuals. Uh, however, both camps, food allergy tends to track more with allergic rhinitis, eczema, things like that. Uh, they can be multi-morbid, whereas drug allergy folks tend to be more so adults, and they can be multi-morbid, particularly when you think about problems with transplant populations or other, um, uh, with chemotherapy, for example. And that's precisely why, I, you know, one thing I'm excited about is our division is trying to create a, a dedicated drug allergy clinic uh, at HHS uh, over here at Mumsy uh, that uh, Dr. Wasman is heading up. So uh, that's one thing I'm very excited about. Um, lastly, uh, what, why was there still sedation with, um, uh, with second generation antihistamines, even though they're H1? It's exactly the point. Maybe we don't know enough yet about the comparative efficacy and harms of H1 antihistamines. We've taken them for granted. And that's precisely why on the heels of Pisces, we are doing a systematic review, a massive systematic review and network meta-analysis of all H1 antihistamines and their efficacy and safety. So that's being headed up by a all-star team of undergrads and, uh, and graduate students that I'm heading up and medical students. Uh, and uh, you know, I can't wait to show you the data um, that's coming out, but there likely are gonna be uh, differences and probably some underappreciation about 
the potential harms uh, that are associated with these drugs. Um, so that's the, the short answer, I think, to, to those three. I hope that's adequate. Thank you, uh, Derek. There are a few questions in the Q&A uh, section. So there's one about what do, you, what do you think the biggest, after some praise, you know, what do you think the biggest uh, outstanding biological and immunological questions uh, are in food allergy that remain, which uh, will impact your clinic? Right. So, you know, ultimately, you know, we're, we're a big team in terms of different aspects of uh, attacking the problem of understanding and addressing food allergy. I mean, Dr. Jordana and Dr. Um, Koenig here are addressing a lot of the basic science aspects in terms of understanding the, the actual pathogenesis and pathophysiology behind food allergy and its persistence and uh, thinking about ways of manipulating that. Um, in terms of the clinical translation um, is where Titan and Trader are coming in. To me, the big questions still are, how do we prevent food allergy? Uh, when we do find someone that's food allergic, can we, number one, make them not food allergic? And lastly, if someone does have a food allergic reaction, can we rescue them? What's the right way of rescuing? And actually, those three big questions uh, have not been adequately addressed. We do not have rigorous randomized trials. We tend to be working on those problems that I said, hot topics at a time, small studies, and financial gain alone, being led by pharma. So instead, I submit what we need is dedicated infrastructure, funding, and the culture of randomized trials to do those large randomized trials that we're so used to in general internal medicine. We don't have the, the same concept of, you know, uh, the, the evidence for aspirin or statins or anything like that uh, for cardiovascular medicine that we do for allergy. We would even be happy right now with a 40 patient trial. Can you imagine using, making that, you know, big decisions for populations that affect 30% of the world without any funding? There is zero Canada research chairs dedicated to allergy. Zero across all the, the whole nation. So there's no clinical investigation dedicated to allergy. We need that. Uh, we need some dedicated funding infrastructure. So we need to develop a culture of large randomized trials, and we need to develop this in Canada especially because we're one of the developed nations and we're one of the leaders in EBM. Good thinking. Good thinking. No doubt about that. Uh, just kind of follow up with that question from uh, uh, Michael here about uh, the oral immunotherapy and why do you think it has been successful in uh, sustaining uh, responsiveness uh, to a peanut? That's great. Great question, Mike. Thanks so much. Happy to chat offline as well. Um, so there's been great data um, that um, we worked on uh, in the while I was uh, completing my PhD in the early years of uh, uh, transition to faculty uh, that's been headed out of Dr. Jordana's lab that's shown the examination of immune memory. Uh, and so what we've seen so far with peanut, uh, and you, you might recall, you might think about some parallels with the early data from venom immunotherapy um, in that with peanut, uh, so far, we are not very successful in changing that immune memory underlying uh, peanut allergy with high dose oral immunotherapy. As you might recall with venom, for example, in the early stages of venom immunotherapy, we used to give bucket loads of crude venom uh, for hymenoptera or singing insects. And we found that venom immunotherapy didn't work and it actually also caused harm. But when we became more sophisticated, found it precisely which doses to use and use more purified or, uh, uh, and, and specific extracts, then we were able to find more long-lasting changes with venom. And perhaps that's where we need to go. But this is not going to happen uh, unless we've got the randomized trials to show it. And Nestle is not going to be too happy if we say the product doesn't work. Perfect. Uh, another question, Dr. Carnot, the thinking about uh, uh, IgA food mediated, uh, uh, sort of IgE mediated food allergies and comments on, uh, you know, people with celiac disease, lactose intolerance, uh, uh, are, are these patients uh, yeah. avoiding the right thing or what, should, what, what's, what, I mean, a lot, of, we, we see a lot of those patients, right? And uh, Gr yeah. what are your thoughts on? Great, great point, Greg. So, you know, one of the commonest ones is atopic dermatitis. If you haven't seen it, 
we did just publish a systematic review and meta-analysis on the role of diet elimination for atopic dermatitis is in Jackie in practice in press. Uh, happy to send that along if you'd like. Now, these other diseases like lactose intolerance and celiac, we actually um, uh, are not uh, IgE mediated. Uh, there are other more allergic diseases that are non IgE mediated, but these ones we actually uh, refer more to GI in, the, in their management. Celiac has a whole other uh, approach. Generally, yes, it is dietary avoidance, but there may be other strategies and someone like um, uh, you know, the gastroenterologist here and Dr. Verdu, for instance, may have better insights into, into that. Uh, but celiac has a whole different management, you know, the association with uh, possible lymphoma as well as a key aspect to management. But yes, dietary avoidance is, is a separate component to that. Uh, with different mechanisms. Same thing with lactose intolerance it tends to be more of a digestive issue. And then of course, the corresponding uh, osmotic changes that then occur that lead to bloating and diarrhea and so on. So these tend to be uh, uh, a slightly different approach to management, um, but great question. All right, I think we have time for another question. Uh, Dr. Satya asked about uh, your understand, like mechanistic understanding of age influences on food allergy and is there be any evidence on uh, related to breastfeeding, uh, prenatal, antenatal uh, risk factors? Yeah, thanks so much, Imran. And uh, again, also happy to chat offline. Great question. It, it does track with what Anne uh, initially proposed, which is we don't have a great sense about what are the actual risk factors for food allergy. We have no idea. If you look at guidelines across the world, they'll say family history is a risk factor. And then another guideline will say a family history is not a risk factor. Breastfeeding, yes, no. Um, they're all over the map. And the problem is we don't have the evidence. We don't, no one has actually systematically reviewed. People are more interested in doing study after study after study, but not actually taking a pause to systematically review all the data to find out where we're at, to clean house before you buy new furniture. Um, and so we're, we're trying to address that right now. Um, but, uh, when it comes to say breastfeeding, a little bit challenging to, to examine, of course, because of the competing interests of promoting breastfeeding for overall health, as well as understanding its role in food allergy to say a unsystematic review of the examination of the data has, is mixed, uh, at the bottom line. So the, our systematic review. I hope we'll try to address that and quantify the amount of uncertainty around it. Uh, we all hope to believe that breastfeeding is protective, but not necessarily known. Uh, the main thing so far from randomized trials that we can infer is that likely delaying introduction uh, promotes food allergy, but how much, we don't know. Excellent. Uh, Derek, we are on time, and this has been fantastic, very challenging, very informative, and a great uh, discussion. Uh, we appreciate your presentation today and uh, great work, and keep up that great work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Happy to chat. All right. Uh, wish everyone a great day. Take care. Okay, bye.